verses this morning, Romans chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. I hope you brought your Bible. We really, honestly, I don't think that I would have a whole lot of anything good to say if I didn't have the Bible. So it's important that you have your Bible. Romans chapter 1, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to read along with me, verses 15 and 16. First we'll read, then we'll pray, and then we'll be seated. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you that you gave us what we needed that, Lord, when we were lost, when we were in sin, when there was no hope for us, that you provided for us through your Son, Lord, the way of salvation. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can be here this morning, that we can gather together to look into your word, to see what your word has to say. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts would, Lord, be open to receive your truth, that everyone here would be, Lord ready to respond to your voice and that, dear God, you would just empower, Lord, the preaching this morning in a special way and that you would be with us in the service. We'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Seems like the older I get, the older I get, the more I realize that the simple message of the gospel is becoming more and more scarce in pulpits today. It's almost as if there's a movement, a movement away from proclaiming the simple truths of the gospel, which is the only message, by the way, that can ever change your life. The word gospel is mentioned 17 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not mentioned in John. I don't know why. I guess John just never wrote that word. But it's mentioned another six times in the book of Acts. And then it's mentioned another 81 times in the rest of the epistles. Now that's quite a lot, the word gospel is used in the Bible. Altogether, the word gospel is used 104 times in the New Testament. Now, there are a few places, especially in, the, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where you know it's, it's actually a, a, a parallel passage, meaning another guy wrote and said the same thing as the other guy. And so you could really kind of count that as one if you wanted to. But even if we did that, we would still have at least ten separate occasions where Jesus spoke about the gospel specifically. Most of us, if you've been around church any time at all, you know that the gospel, the word gospel means what? Good news. Good news. We know that. Yet it appears that there are quite a few folk today that are ashamed of the gospel message. For whatever reason, they don't appreciate it. They don't like its simplicity. They don't like the message of the gospel. Some people deny the gospel. They deny it because they cannot accept the fact that it's so simple. They can't accept the fact that it, it charges man with sinfulness and condemnation and in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Others ignore the gospel. They'll pretend that there is no God, no heaven, no hell, no afterlife, no personal responsibility. We'll just ignore all of that and live however we want to. Then there are others who are so offended by the true gospel that they will take the true gospel and they'll change it into another gospel, which Paul says, if you remember from last week, is not another at all. But whatever the case may be, it is obvious, at least it's obvious to me, that we're living in a time when folks don't really like the simple, true gospel message. Now, the Bible is very descriptive concerning the gospel. In Matthew, Matthew liked to call it the gospel of the kingdom. I think, personally, he think that he did that because it is only by obedience to the gospel message by which a person can enter into the kingdom. So, therefore, it is called the gospel of the kingdom. Mark likes to call it the gospel. In fact, he begins in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. He begins by calling it 
the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because salvation, my friend, is not found in a plan. It's found in a man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That's what the Bible tells us. Luke calls it the gospel of the grace of God. I kind of like that. The gospel of the grace of God. Because <laughs> the gospel explains how salvation is by the grace of God and not by our own works. That's what I meant when I said it's so simple. It's nothing you do. All you simply do is receive it. Believe it. Paul, throughout his writings, he refers to it as, as being the gospel of peace. Because without it, we cannot have peace. We cannot have peace with God. And we cannot have the peace of God in our hearts without first submitting to the gospel. So with all this being true, and we know it's true, and I've not given you anything that you probably don't already know, but with all this being true, you would think that, that men would be just, just desiring, longing to have this wonderful gospel. But for some reason, we find out that they don't. For some reason, we realize that they won't receive it. They won't believe it. They reject it. Men ought to love it. They ought to love the gospel message, but instead they reject it because they do not want the condemnation that comes, the conviction that comes when we receive the gospel and we admit that we're in need. Since man doesn't like to be told that he's in need, and we don't, if I walked up to you and I said, you know what? You know, what, if, what if I walked up to, to Brother John here? I'll just pick on him because he's leaving. He's going back to college, so you know, he's got about three months not to be angry before he sees me again at best. And so I'll pick on him. But what if I walked up to John and I said, John, your pl piano playing is in need. I mean, you seriously in need. In fact, you're a complete failure in your piano playing. You're terrible in piano playing. You cannot play piano. You're horrible. Do you think he'd like that? No. He's sitting there right now going, man, I hope he doesn't really think that. I don't really think that. But what if I did do that? What if I walked up to you? What if you were, you know, on the job? And let's say we'll pick on Ozzy because Ozzy, he, you know, he is like the enemy of, of my old career field. And so uh, I pick on him and I say, you don't know anything about your job. You're a total failure in your job. I don't even see how you've made it this far in life. I don't even. You think you'd like that? No, of course not. Nobody likes to be told that they're failures. But folks, spiritually speaking, without Jesus Christ, we are failures. Those of us who are Christians, we came to a point in our life where we admitted that. Where we agreed with God that we were lost, we were hopeless without Him. No one likes to hear that. But that's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the message. And since man doesn't like to be told he's in need, he will continue in his sickness Rather than accept the cure, doesn't like the idea of being helpless, to be confronted with his sin nature. So therefore, man, in general, does not want the gospel, doesn't like it. But at the same time, we need that. We need that Holy Ghost conviction. We need the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember what we read earlier in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Did you notice what... What he said, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, to everyone. It is the power of God. So what's wrong with the gospel? What's wrong with it today that people don't want it? And the only conclusion that I can come to is that there's nothing wrong with the gospel. It's perfect. God gave us a perfect message. As long as it's a true gospel. The problem is not the gospel. The problem is man. We're the problem. Today the world is filled with counterfeits. How many of y'all have been to Itaewon? Anybody been to Itaewon? Those are not real Nikes. Okay. Polo shirts, free washings, they fall apart. Trust me, they're not the real McCoy. Counterfeit. Counterfeiting is big today. Counterfeiting money is rampant. Individuals counterfeit money. A couple of weeks ago when I began preparing this message, I began looking on the internet at some of the counterfeiting things that are done. I mean, some of those guys are good, real good. Individuals counterfeit money, but did you know that even a couple of nations have actually counterfeited money? 
Nations, governments have even countered. Germany did it during World War II. You read about that if you study World War II. They counterfeited money. Pakistan recently did it in 2009. They counterfeited a bunch of Indian money because they were trying to destabilize um, India's economy. So they were counterfeiting all this Indian money. Counterfeiting. It's rampant. Just last week, I, I read about some, somebody that was counterfeiting high school diplomas. You don't need to go to high school anymore. Just get yourself a high school diploma. And you know, and I know, it's been in the news recently, in, in the last few years, about professors in, in colleges all over the world who they found out that they counterfeited their college diplomas. Yeah, one lady said she went to Harvard. She'd never even been, been to Harvard. She had a big diploma on her wall. So she'd been to Harvard, never been there. Counterfeiting. It, it's happening all over. And the sad thing is, the worst part about it is, is the worst counterfeiters are those who counterfeit the truth. <coughs> Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a couple of passages here I want us to, to look at. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll look at verses 13 through 15. I'm in 1 Corinthians. No wonder it didn't look right. <coughs> Let me try this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 13 through 15, it says, For such are false apostles, not true apostles, false ones, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're not really apostles of Christ. They, they make themselves that. Verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You see, there are false apostles, false teachers out there who are preaching a false truth. If you back up in the same chapter, look at verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4, But I fear, this is what Paul writes, he's writing to the Corinthian church, he says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted, from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with them. What Paul was saying is, there are those out there that are false teachers, and they're preaching another Jesus. Not the Jesus of the Bible, but another one. And they're and they're, they're leading with another spirit. Not the Holy Spirit of God, but the other team. And they're preaching another gospel, which he says is not another. And he says, those people you're listening to, you're bearing with those people. Along with these false teachers come the false truths, false spirits. These other gospels are false gospels. They're void <laughs> of grace. They are void of truth. They are anti-God and they offer no true or lasting peace. You find those that are wrapped up and involved in cults all around the world and they're struggling every day. Most of them working, trying to earn their salvation which Jesus already bought and paid for. And all they had to do is accept that. Now I know that there are many churches today that still preach the truth for which we thank God. And yet there are many more churches who present us with another gospel, and those other gospels have some really big problems. Now we began touching on this last week, and this week I want to get a little bit more in depth into this. The other gospels. If you have your bulletin, you can see that it's really a simple outline. The first thing we learn about the other gospels is, is that they, are, they have big problems because there is the neglected portions in the other Gospels. Things that are left out, if you will. For one thing, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. We sang about that this morning. Did you notice that? Saved by the blood of the crucified one. It's another great song. I, I had a hard time deciding what songs to choose this morning. So many great songs. The blood of Christ is left out of the other Gospels. It's either de-emphasized or removed altogether. I heard of a preacher who once proclaimed publicly that he wanted nothing to do with that bloody gospel. He said that bloody gospel, it is violent, 
and repulsive. Violent and repulsive. I agree. It is violent. It is violent that the innocent blood of the Savior Jesus Christ was shed at the hands of evil men. That's violent. The cross was violent, no doubt about it. The blood that was shed was violent, no question about it. Yet we need to remember that it was that, that blood of Christ which cleanses us. You see, the bloodless gospel has no power to cleanse your sins. According to the Bible, without the blood, there can be no remission of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Almost all things are by the law purged without blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. You cannot be forgiven without that. We require that in order to be forgiven. The Bible speaks very plainly. It says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Thus, it is the shedding of pure, sinless blood which will cleanse our sins. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The precious blood of Christ, that is what cleansed us. So without the shedding of Christ's blood, there can be no salvation. If you're trusting in another gospel, another way, if you will, trust and know that you cannot be saved. There's only one plan or one way to be saved. Today, modernists want a gospel that doesn't speak of the blood. If you think about that, they're in agreement with Satan because the devil hates the blood too. Have you thought about that? Notice this situation in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. You see, Jesus was very adamant concerning his death. It is necessary. It is not enough for us to believe that Jesus was a good man. It is not enough for us to believe that Jesus was a, a wise prophet. It is not enough to believe that Jesus was a great leader. Though all of those things are true, we must go beyond that and believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Without that, it's not enough. Without the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you cannot be born again. There is no other way. It is necessary. The blood of Christ is the basis of the gospel. The basis. On the night that he went to the cross, that night in the upper room, Jesus offered a cup of wine to his disciples, and he says this in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Jesus says this, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, he had not died yet. But he was pointing out the very fact that, that the very basis of the gospel is his blood. The New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The pouring of the wine in the cup symbolized the blood of Christ, which would soon be poured out for all who would come to believe in him. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he did away with the old covenant requirement of sacrifices of animals. He became the final sacrifice by one offering. He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14. Folks, listen. A bloodless gospel is not a gospel. The second thing wrong with modern gospels, with the other gospels, if you will, is that hell is either missing or ignored. You can listen to some of these big name preachers on TV. And they'll, they'll preach a, a nice, wonderful message about 
loving man and, and doing good and helping little old ladies cross the street and all that stuff. But rarely will they ever mention hell. In fact, some of them will never mention hell. They ignore it. They won't preach it. But I remind you that in the Bible, no one ever preached hell the same way that Jesus did. I read that Jesus preached more on hell than he did on heaven. I checked that out. That's not true, actually. It's not. He preached on heaven more. If you look at all the scriptures where Jesus speaks, he spoke of heaven more than he did hell. But the reality is, no one ever preached hell the way Jesus did. He knew the reality of hell. He understood what hell was all about. I remind you, when no one else had ever seen it, Jesus had. He created that place. He is God in the flesh, and he made all things, including that place. He knew what it was like. We don't really know. We know what the Bible says. We understand that it's a horrible place, but we've never really seen it. When Jesus <laughs> preached hell, he preached it as one who had seen it. In fact, Jesus spoke of hell in over 35 different places. So what does that mean to me? That means that I need to preach hell too. We, we must preach hell to the lost. The average person goes about his day every day, day in and day out, without any consideration that he has a future at stake. That there is more to life than just this life. They don't seem to realize how close they are. Day in and day out, not even understanding that eternal destruction is just around the corner. Separation from God for eternity is just around the corner for them. We must tell them. They are, for the most part, unaware. Do not realize their spiritual condition. And somebody needs to warn them. Probably you've heard the illustration before, but if you were driving down the road, and you saw your neighbor's house on fire, and you knew that mom and dad and three or four children were in there in that house sleeping and their house was on fire, what would you do? Well, I don't want to tell them their house is on fire. They won't like to hear that. That's not pleasing news. They won't like to know that their house is burning down around them. I mean, that's not a very comforting thought. So I'm not going to tell them. I'm just going to keep on driving. Now, you know as well as I do that none of us would do that. We would stop. We would get out of the car, we'd run to our neighbor's house, we'd bang on that door until they opened, and if they didn't open, we would knock the door down, we would go in there, we would wake them up, and we would do everything we could to get them out of that burning home. Now folks are going to hell every day, and we pass them by, and we don't even think about it. We don't even care most of the time. And if we did care, we'd do nothing. Folks, listen, hell is a real, literal place. And people are going there. People that you know and people that you love. And we need to tell them. We need to preach hell. We need to tell hell, or tell Christians about hell. We need, to, we need to wake Christians up because people all around us are going there. They're getting closer every day. But here we are, asleep. Spiritually. We go to church, read our Bibles. Some of us get up in the morning, read our Bibles, and have our prayer time. Go off to work, and that's the last time that we even think or care anything about God. And we go through the rest of our day with people who are condemned. And we don't say anything to them. We need to preach hell. If you could see their lost condition. I mean, if you could really see it and see how hell was waiting for them. Maybe you'd start to pray more and work more toward their salvation. Christians need to hear about hell. Today we got the modernists and postmodernists, and they want to paint a picture of God as some kind of soft, cuddly grandfather, you know, sitting up in heaven on his rocking chair out on his front porch, you know, with candy in his pockets for his for his children, and you know, that, that God is, oh, that's all right, you know, I know you look, I'm a grandparent. I know grandparents look at their grandkids and they think that their grandkids are perfect. Mine are. The rest of y'all only really think that. Mine really are. We think that our grandkids are perfect, but God is not a grandfather. No, sir. He is a father. And as a father, we look at our children and we know that they're not perfect. And we know that there's a lot of work to be done. When God looks at us, he's not winking at our ignorance anymore. He's not closing his eyes at our condition at all. In fact, the Bible tells us that we have a, a holy God. A God who cannot condone or overlook wickedness, 
There is a place called hell, and those who die without repentance and faith in Jesus Christ are going to go there. That's serious. Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I've heard some of these preachers that don't like to talk about hell. And they'll take the Greek words or the Hebrew words or whatever, and they'll say, well, this could actually mean this, or that could actually mean that. And you know what? There's not much you can do with lake of fire. Lake of fire is... Lake of fire. I looked it up in the Greek. Do you know what it says in the Greek? This is really deep. You're going to love this. It says, Lake of fire. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that's a real, literal, horrible place. And people are really, literally, horribly going there every day. Rome, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving... And the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, you say, Phew. I made it. I'm none of those. Oh, wait a minute. There's one more. And all liars. That condemns us all. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's no escape, folks. Without Jesus Christ, every one of us are condemned on our way to a literal hell. Psalm 9 verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now we could go on and on and on. There are lots more verses about hell in the Bible. But I think we've made the point. The ironic thing about this whole thing is that God never really desired for anybody to go there. He tells us in Matthew that, the, that hell was created for the devil and his angels. And yet there will be millions, maybe even billions of people there that God never desired for us to go there. He never desired or does not desire for us to be condemned. And that leads me up to the very next point. The third thing wrong with so many of the other Gospels is that repentance is either absent or misrepresented. Like I said earlier, nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. Nobody wants to be told that they're sinful and wicked but that is exactly the truth. If I walked up to you and I looked at you and I said, you are ungodly, you wouldn't like it. If I walked up to you and I said, you are a sinner. Now, God is not overlooking sin. God wants us to repent of it. Jesus made that very clear. If you look at Luke chapter 13. Turn back to Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or of those eighteen upon whom the tower of Shalom fell and slew them, Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. <clears throat> to me, this is a pretty interesting passage. You know, Jesus' opponents come to him, and they present him with the situation. Some people from up north in Galilee had apparently come down, they visited Jerusalem, and somehow they'd fallen into big trouble. Big, big trouble. They made Pilate angry. Maybe they'd gone into the temple to offer sacrifices and under the cover, cover of religious rites, or maybe they started sowing seeds of revolution against Rome. 
We don't really know what they did. Maybe they drew mustaches on Pilate's picture. I don't know what they did. But they got Pilate angry. And he took them and he killed them. The Roman governor slaughtered these Galileans and he mixed their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. Based on Jesus' replies, it's a gruesome report. But based on Jesus' reply to this report, it seems like those who, who were telling him about it were looking down their noses at those deceased Galileans. They're saying, look at these guys, Jesus. Man, they must have been really bad for that to happen to them. They must be pretty big sinners if God let that happen to them. They were thinking that. They were thinking, well, these Galileans, they must have been terrible sinners before God in order for God to allow them to be killed that way. But Jesus' answer was very brief and very to the point. His answer is basically, you think those Galileans are worse? You think that they're worse than all the other Galileans because they suffered that way? Absolutely not. And then Jesus calls forth another disaster. It had just been that morning on Yahoo News. And everybody had read about it. And everybody knew about it. The Tower of Shalom had fallen over and killed a bunch of people. So he calls to mind this construction accident that happens. 18 people have been crushed and killed. And Jesus asked them, do you really think they were worse sinners? Because the tower fell over and killed them? No. Now what was his point? His point he makes here, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And he wasn't talking about physical death. He was saying that they needed to repent. To turn from their sins and turn to God. That was his point. Repent. What a big word. Do you know that repent was the first command preached on the day of Pentecost? It was the first command preached. It came as an answer to the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Jesus said, or, or Peter said, repent. John the Baptist, he began his ministry by preaching repentance. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus comes along later in Matthew 4, verse 7, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul preaches it in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, repent. You cannot escape repentance in the scriptures. Jesus commissioned us. Did you know that Jesus commissioned us to preach repentance? Look in Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Luke 24, verse 47. <clears throat> Jesus is about to ascend back to the Father. He gives them the great commission. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke. You can see it in Acts. You find it reflected uh, throughout the epistles and so forth. But this is what he says to them. Verse 46, he said unto them, Thus it was written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. The third day, verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus commissioned us to preach repentance and remission of sins. <laughs> So if we will not preach repentance, then maybe that's why we don't see any real converts. Have you ever thought about that? You know, I hear preachers and pastors all over the world, you read, you know, news, uh, religious news, and they say that the churches are dying, the churches are dying. Churches that preach the gospel and repentance, they're not dying. People are getting saved. They're not dying. Churches that are dying are really already dead. Because there's no real gospel in them. They're the ones that are in trouble. If we'll not re preach repentance, then we'll not see real conversion. One reason why we have so many false conversions today is because there's no genuine repentance. You see so much of that. You know, they go to the door, they knock at the door. Hey, do you want to go to hell? No. You want to go to heaven? Yeah. Well, then let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. God, God. I love you. I love you. Can you please take me to heaven? Can you please take me to heaven? Amen. Amen. Well, there you are. You're in. Here's your free ticket. Folks, that's not the gospel. That's what we call easy believism. There's no working in the heart. There's no Holy Spirit conviction. There's no, con there's no conversion from their sin. They do not feel any guilt. They do not feel any shame for their sins. They do not really repent. And we give them a free ticket to heaven? I don't think so. That's not the way it works. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, he says, Now I rejoice, 
Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For, get this, verse 10, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I can come up to you and say, hey, 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 you need to stop drinking. You need to stop running around, and you need to stop acting like a fool. Don't you realize your wife is at home suffering? Your kids are suffering. You're spending half your money on, on gambling and, and, and alcohol and, and cigarettes, and your kids don't even have decent clothes to wear to school. What's the matter with you? Oh, man, I'm really a rotten guy. I need to give that stuff up. Great, now what have we done? We created a moral guy who is still going to die without Jesus. You get my point? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. When a person is confronted with their sinfulness, and they understand the penalty of that sin is death and hell, then they'll turn. And not a moment before. Tell a rich man that, he's dying, that, that he needs to be saved, he'll look at you and he'll say, from what? I'm having a good life here. A fourth aspect of other Gospels is, is that a changed life, which is what we get when we're born again, a changed life is either non-compulsory, in other words, you don't really have to do it, or it's minimized. Well, yeah, you don't have to be real holy. I mean, you can just give up one or two things and keep everything else. Just tack Jesus on to your dirty, rotten, sinful life and everything be all right. But that's not what the Word of God says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All, behold, all things are become new. Now, if I understand this verse correctly, when we get saved, the Lord gives us a new life. In Christ, our old life dies, and we change. Now, none of us are perfect. None of us are ever going to be perfect, at least not in this life. But you are not your want to. You don't want to do anything anymore that you used to do. You want to be different. You have a desire that God put within you to live for Him and to do what's right. And if you didn't get that, you need to be checking out to see what kind of salvation you got because my Bible tells me that God changes me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says, It is God which worketh in you both to will, in other words, your desire, I want to, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not only do you want to do right things, but you will do right things. That's in the Bible, folks. That's God's word. It's because of these passages of scriptures and others like them that make it very clear to me that a lot of people didn't get the same salvation I got. I don't know what they got, but they didn't get the same one I got. Because all... All real believers will change. They will be different. Nowadays, the other Gospels present a salvation as if it's nothing more than just an insurance plan, you know? No, the Gospel changes lives. It changes lives. The Gospel changes you. People today, they want to add Jesus to their dirty, rotten lives, but you cannot do that. In Luke chapter 5, verses 36 through 39... Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 5, 36 through 39. <clears throat> and he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, the old is better. See, there's the problem. Those that are in the old life, they desire the old life, they don't want the new life. And Jesus says you can't put new wine, the gospel, into old bottles, old dead religion. You can't do that. It doesn't fit. Jesus will not fit into your life. He will change you. He will make you a new bottle so that you can have a life worthy of his filling. Anytime you hear a preacher or any other person say, well, you don't have to really change your life, you can be sure that he's not preaching the same gospel that the Bible has. 
You need to remember that. Things that are neglected from the other Gospels today. Now let's quickly look at the added portions. We kind of touched on this a little bit last week. Well, one thing that we find added today is works. Works and faith are in direct conflict. Works will ultimately be a hindrance to real salvation because works are a product of our flesh. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If you are trying to do a work of the flesh, if you are trying to work your way to heaven, you need to understand that you will never be able to work hard enough. You will never be able to do enough good works. Romans chapter 4, verse 4, it says that we have a debt. We are debtors, and we cannot work off that debt. No matter what we do, Jesus must do it or it cannot be done. What kind of insult is that to God, who gave his son to die on the cross for you and I, and we look at God and we say, no, God, that's all right. I don't want your plan. I'll make it my own. I'll do it my way. After God has said, you can't do it, and I love you so much, and I know you can't do it, so I'm giving you my son. Will you accept this plan? Nope, I'll do it my way. I don't need you, God. I'll get down my own way. What an insult. He's given his son for our sins, yet mankind rejects his son in favor of his own plan. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. You didn't deserve it. He saved you according to his mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's a false hope that we could somehow, some way, do something that would ever be good enough to get us into heaven. The only person that's ever done anything good enough to get me into heaven was Jesus. Nothing else works. Works added to the gospel perverts the gospel and changes it into another gospel which can do nothing for you. Another thing that I see often added today is plain old humanism. Humanism. The world is cursed, cursed with a blight, if you will, of positive thinkers and prosperity preachers. They try to tell you that sin or blood or hell or repentance or judgment, those are negative terms and we ought not use them. Don't say negative things. Say positive things. Make people feel good. You know, I, I don't want people to, to feel bad. I don't want to hurt people's feelings. You might not believe that after this morning, but the truth is, I don't like to offend people. I like people to like me. I want people to like me. But I don't want people to be happy and go to hell, and I was responsible for telling them and didn't do so, and now I'm responsible for not giving them the message that could have changed and saved them. I don't want that either. I want to please the Lord. You know, you know what Peter and John said? They, they said, you, you decide, is it right for me to please man or God? Obviously, it's right to please God. So I have to tell people. We must tell people. There is no room to eliminate all the negative things that we don't like. Those negative things help us understand where we really are in life. The Bible is clear. These are necessary elements to the message of salvation. How many missionaries are traveling the globe today seeking to reform society and it